Good. So, hi, hi everyone. So, I'm Atish Gonzalez. I'm the I'm the Global Learning Director at the Humanitarian Leadership Academy, and I'm also joined here with uh, Marcus. So. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Marcus Borsberg. I'm the Membership Coordinator with a long title than the, the International Association of Professionals in Humanitarian Assistance and Protection, a, a professional association of humanitarian workers. And, and Mark, Marcus will talk a little bit more about PHAP as well, but just very quickly about myself. So uh, I, I came to the Academy last year. It's a fairly new organization, which was incubated by Save the Children UK. Uh, uh, and uh, it's, it's now been operation for one year. But before that, I, I led something called Disaster Ready, um, and I worked for the UN, the United Nations Refugee Agency for many years, but I have more of a tech background, so I have an interesting insight on how technology and humanitarian and learning can come together to, to solve a lot of the problems you just saw uh, on, on, on the video there. So overall, the mission of this new organization, and it's quite a, it's quite a significant investment by a few big donors in this, in this initiative, is to empower humanitarians at a local level to lead uh, the preparedness and response in their own disaster. So that's the overall mission statement uh, for this organization. Everything that we're trying to do is through collaboration, so it's working very much at an international level with, with the actors like the UN and the, and the international NGOs, but at very much at the local levels as well, with the local, local actors, the local organizations who are at the front lines of, of response. Uh, I, I'm based out of the London office, which is in a way a support function, but a lot of our operations are going to happen through these regional presence. Um, and so currently we have presence in, in the Philippines and Kenya and in the Middle East, but we are setting up in Bangladesh, Indonesia, West Africa, Latin America. So the idea is in the next five years we'll, we'll have 10 centers supporting 40 countries. Uh, and this is a bit of the timeline. So it's a, it's a very busy timeline at the moment. Uh, a lot of a lot of travels are involved, but it's very much a lot of this learning and training and all is going to happen very much at that grassroots um, level. So I'll, I'll switch gears a bit. I'll talk. I want to talk a little bit about why we hear this conference in terms of learning, and I think what I hope to present is a bit more of a case study of how learning and badging and recognition of skills is so vital and so important for the types of responders you're seeing who need to try to solve these very critical problems. Uh, my overall vision when I came to the academy and, and was that the academy's role in this in this very crowded space. There's a lot of actors. There's a lot of organisations are already uh, involved in humanitarian action. Uh, was that we would be act as a facilitator of access to platforms, tools, and resources that would make locally relevant capacity sharing and mutual learning possible. And in, in our sector, we use this word capacity building a lot, and I really don't like this word. It has a very pejorative connotation. I like to say it's mutual learning and capacity sharing. That's how learning is truly going to happen at the grassroots levels. So how it's going to happen, one is through this, the centers I mentioned in the, in the 10 countries, uh, in the 10 regions. But on the digital side as well, we've launched a, a digital platform which acts almost like a marketplace of learning in the sector uh, called Kaya. We are looking at various knowledge platforms, innovation, uh, incubators, uh, and we're working on creating collaboration centers, which are, we're trying not to do everything ourselves. And Marcus will talk about the recognition center, which is looking at how we recognize the skills of humanitarians uh, who are trying to solve these very complex problems. We're looking at collaboration centers around research, because a lot of investment, a lot of money goes into this, this sector. But, we're, we're unsure about how impactful that, that action actually is. So we're trying to also sort of invest in research and, and, and also the research on, research on the learning. So we invest in learning, but what, what is the impact of that learning then uh, that, we, that we are putting all this money into? Uh, our core audience, so this is just three, three groups, but it's a little, I mean, there's obviously overlaps between a couple of these groups. We've got the local responders, so the people who are actually on the ground, the local Red Cross volunteers, the people, the, the, the schools, the communities who are actually on the front lines when something like Hurricane Matthew hits uh, or the Ebola crisis happens. So, so they are the ones who are really at the front lines. The humanitarian organizations, so the large organizations like the UN and the Save the Children and Oxfam, to the smaller humanitarian organizations, the local organizations on the ground. And learning and development providers. So learning and development providers could be within these humanitarian organizations, but we're also increasingly working with outside of the humanitarian system, with local government academies, with the private sector, 
The private sector is very interested, for example, when in the Philippines uh, they, they have uh, typhoons and hurricanes all the time. So when the, a, a typhoon hits, how can the businesses be up and running right away so that entire supply chain gets hit? How, how, how is that continuity uh, maintained? So these are our three sort of core audiences we are trying to support. Uh, our work is guided by nine principles. The key ones, I guess, especially for this audience here, is around reusability, openness, so all the platforms, content, learning uh, we, are, we are trying to invest in or share. We're, we're focusing very much on that openness of that. Uh, and scale is very important because I think a lot of learning training is done in the sector, but it's not done at a big enough scale. It's just the problem is just too vast. Uh, and we have to be innovative, we have to challenge ourselves to say, how can this be done? If you ask a lot of humanitarians, how, what do you think of training? The first thing that will come to my, their mind is a training workshop where people are sitting in a classroom and that works. There is a lot of, of that type of training which works and you put people through simulations and get them to practice first aid and all of this, but there is a lot of learning which can be scaled up through virtu virtually digital ways where the sector has resisted for a long time. And there are clear challenges around that because, I mean, some areas there are band, there's no bandwidth, you know, there's no internet. So, but it, it's about working, working around those problems rather than trying to say actually this just won't work. But scale is very important for us. We have very ambitious goals in terms of how many people we want to reach even in the in the second year of our uh, existence. So some of the key things and, uh, that we're trying to do, and this starts to link into this, the theme of the conference is providing content. So what is the high quality content that all humanitarian professionals or volunteers need? Uh, whether that's how do, how do I work with children affected with disasters? How do I, how do I not go completely crazy in, in terms of when I'm working on the high stress environment? So the psychosocial support, uh, or what are the core principles, the, the, the core Red Cross principles that everyone uh, needs to know? Uh, and and Interestingly, we did a lot of learning needs assessments from a lot of the humanitarian organizations and, and individuals, and the core skills which are coming back, the, the core needs which are coming back are not only the humanitarian technical skills, but the professional skills like, like writing proposals or leadership or project management, and these are skill sets which are much more widely across uh, fr from, from the humanitarian sector. But then once you have this content, then how do you enable access to this learning? And, and then how do you make that more accessible? How do you bring that to life through, whether that's virtually, in person, um, in a, at, at a distance? And then how do you recognize those skills? So once people have this learning, they've gone through these assessments, how do you recognize those skills consistently across the sector? We have challenges where you've got international responders, so people who've who've been gone to a, an educational institution in the West uh, who may have lesser experience versus someone, let's say, who's been working in West Africa who doesn't have the same level of formal qualification, but they have years of experience, but how can that skill and experience be captured in a way that brings them sort of almost at the same level? So those are the types of challenges that we, we face in, in our sector. But just as people move across from one humanitarian organization to the other, how are those skills interoperable? Uh, how are this learning interoperable across the, the MSF or the UN system or the I international NGO system or the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement? And finally, how do you support organizations with their internal leads? And this is a very strong focus for us on local organizations. Uh, I was at the World Humanitarian Summit now in Istanbul where a lot of the global leaders came together and said we need to solve this problem and, and, and they said a lot of fancy things. And, uh, but, but really, I think one of the key themes just coming out from there, and people talk a lot about this, but they don't do it enough, is how do local organizations, how are local organizations better empowered to respond? Because they are the first ones there, they know their context, um, and, and, and I think that, that, that paradigm shift needs to happen and it hasn't happened fast enough. And we're sort of seeing that roll around, learning being one I issue here in terms of that localization piece, but how can, if local responders, local NGOs have better access to high quality learning and have their skills recognized, then maybe that will change the discussion um, a little bit. So these are just some of the examples around how we're working in terms of aggregating content. So we're very much trying to aggregate content from the sector, whether it's humanitarian, academic, uh, or, or the private sector, looking at how do we enable access 
right from the community responder level, so that's people like you and me who are just impacted directly by a disaster in their community, right up to more senior levels in a, in a humanitarian organization. Uh, in terms of how we scale up and, and create more flexible models and scalable models of learning for people who are constantly on the move or don't have the same time and, and resources to access learning, how do you create different levels of learning? So I talk about the level one, two, and three, where you have online democratized content or offline content. Uh, and then you start to support uh, learners through coaching and mentoring and, and other ways of adding some human support to that, that learning content. And then obviously what happens in a very localized, in-person format, but trying to build one on top of the other, not going straight only to in-person training all the time for humanitarian training, and not only relying purely on self-guided online learning, but using, them, using that as a combination. Uh, and again, this is not new for a lot of you, but for us, for us in the humanitarian sector, it's something we've really grappled with in terms of how do we scale up access, but at the same time not lose that high quality and engaged um, uh, part of, of the learning experience. In terms of what we are trying to focus on, um, it's we're looking at, at the, in the first year, we've been focusing a lot on what, is it, what are the basic skills that a professional entry-level humanitarian <coughs> needs uh, what is it that a, that a volunteer needs? So we were working with the European refugee crisis and seeing there are a lot of Euro there were a lot of grassroots organisations getting deployed out there, but not necessarily with the right skills. They were taking pictures, for example, of children, posting it on Facebook. This this, this minimum sort of understanding of, of protecting children's rights and safeguarding them. Not everyone knows that. So. Uh, psychosocial support, these, these are traumatized people they're dealing with. How do you work with people who have been affected by disasters? How do you also look after yourself as well? So these core skill sets that, that are needed bo both by professionals and non-professionals. Uh, and then I mentioned some of the more cross-functional skill sets like management and, and, and project management and finance management of, of, for non-finance managers. So it's a, it's a really, uh, there's a lot of money which, which gets handled through the humanitarian system, but not everyone has the right skill sets on how to write, you know, manage budgets and proposals and all of those, those pieces. And, and also, how, how do you do if learning more effectively? And I think we're looking at the learning tool, toolkits around designing and scaling up more effective, accessible, engaged uh, learning formats. Around the recognition of learning piece, I'll talk very briefly. I think Marcus will go a bit more in detail. I, I've taken, uh, the, I think, from Eric's slide um, on, on the Open Badge Anatomy. But we're looking at two levels. We're looking at sort of more self-assessed, light touch badges for completion of learning or, or coaching or mentoring. Um, but then we're looking at more, let's say, rigorous micro-certifications which when combined with badges adds an extra weighting to the badges. Uh, and there again we're looking at off what we're calling off-the-shelf uh, content. So there are existing initiatives like PMD, Project Management for, develop, for Development mm -hmm. Pro, and Finance Management for Development Pro, uh, where there is existing learning and existing certification schemes, and then you can eat more easily tie badging to that. But then how do you also create bespoke certification? There, there isn't really sort of certification formats for this. And I, and I think I'll leave this again to, to Marcus to talk about this. But this is being led by this broader humanitarian passport initiative and, and more specifically by PHAP through the Collaboration Center for Recognition of Learning. Because this is a critical challenge is both for individuals, as an individual humanitarian, how are my skills recognized as I move across organizations, but for organizations as well, the organizations need to know who actually has the right skills or who has the right experience so that they can deploy the right people to the right emergencies as well. So it's on both sides uh, there, there is that requirement. In terms of practically how this can work, I've worked previously, I think, with, with Descendum here around the whole open badge factory and open badge a passport piece for seeing how learning can then be, be self-assessed for light touch badges, use the, the certification scheme for more heavier or more rigorous types of badges where there is a, yeah, and again, I'll, I'll leave that to Marcus to talk about. But I think that the end goal here is that it doesn't matter whether you get your learning from MSF or from UNICEF or from, the U, from, from another UN organization or the academy or disaster ready, 
that you can collect this, these, the, this portfolio of, of, of badges in one place. And that's, that's sort of where we're trying to go. And we're trying to work actually on an on a open badge passport for the humanitarian sector itself. So we're trying to work on a humanitarian passport where the, the humanitarians can then have their, their, their portfolio of skills, learning, and experience, which they can carry, carry with them across the different organizations, countries, and emergencies. So that's where we're trying to go with this. And, and the piece specifically on the certification, uh, Marcus will, will talk about. I'll jump a bit from this into our digital strategy, which I see as well being important to enable all of this, because unless you are, you're finding ways to, to scale up the learning, you, you can't actually get them to then get their certification or badges as well. So we are, we are, we've implemented something called kayaconnect.org, so do have a look if you have a chance, to create this marketplace, a global and learning, uh, and global and local learning portal of humanitarian learning, which will act sort of, sort of as an open access marketplace, uh, which will connect sort of the, the competencies, but will also connect to the badges, uh, we are also linking into things like humanitarian ID. The UN has started something called the humanitarian ID. So you can check into different emergencies with this, with this federated uh, identification system. And we're trying to link into that, that as well. But we're using Moodle and Totara for the core platform. I think what is going to make this platform a bit interesting is we have, if you go and look at it today, there's a lot of very interesting content there. But it's once it starts to get localized. It's once we start to see the Kenya Center, I mentioned, or the Philippines Center, have a humanitarian essentials package for, for the region, for East Africa, in Swahili, or in, in the Philippines, you have what does a disaster preparedness package look like in Tagalog in, in the region. And so it's contextualized, translated, adapted, and then the badges you're getting as well are not just the global badges, but also the local badges. I think that's when it starts to get really interesting for us. And obviously for us, I mean, with the, with the challenges we work, we're looking at how do you make this accessible offline on your mobile. A lot of the, the responders do, will not have the, the time or the luxury to access it on a computer. So how do you make it more accessible and just in time uh, for them? On the innovation side, I'd mentioned we are looking at our role also as, an, as a both as an incubator of interesting learning initiatives which are happening at the grassroots level, as well as the learning about innovation as well. How can organizations better use user-centered design methodologies, use challenges as a way to draw out the best uh, of, of learning within the sector, again, at the grassroots level. So we are looking at our role there as a sort of an incubator, an accelerator of humanitarian learning. We're also experimenting with gamification, and this again ties a bit to the badging concept, but in a slightly different way, around how do you combine knowledge transfer, which we've been talking about, with skills application, with team collaboration, and getting real-time feedback, um, and then wrapping that around with the badge. So you, a lot of the training which, which people do, for example, before they go out in emergency, I've been to a training in Sweden where they kidnap you for half a day, they hood you for about two hours, they, they put you through a first aid course, they put you through all of this training in, in, in two weeks and then you are trying to practice all these skills. And it's a great format of a training, but it's not very scalable. So we're looking at how can you use gamification models to make that type of scenario-based learning more scalable for, for the sector. And this is an example of with UNHCR where we had done this for hostage scenarios where you know the different players get, they get a video of someone who's been taken hostage. They have to come together, uh, negotiate with the hostage taker. They need to come up with a proof of life question together and then they need to respond. And, and all of this then is being played like in, in virtual and real world at the same time. So there's a high pressure component to it. And then they get a badge at the end of it as well that they, you know, there's a gamification element. So this is talking about badges in a slightly different co context, but it's also looking at how can badging be used in this sort of gamification context. Uh, finally, for us, I think the, 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 the really important piece is that we are investing in all this stuff. How do we actually learn from what we're investing in? but learn from what the, the, the wider humanitarian sector is doing around learning as well. So we are focusing quite heavily on research around the, the evaluation, uh, impact, assessment of, of the learning, uh, and looking for research opportunities beyond as well for in, in innovative, interesting humanitarian learning opportunities. 
Uh, our model for partnership, I don't know how many of you would be interested to work, work with the Academy, is, is very much around so bringing together the practitioners, the, the humanitarian organizations, but not just the, the humanitarian system, academia as well. I know there's a lot of academia pr present here today, training providers, uh, the tech sector, um, much broader, and, and uh, what I call on the supply side, and then working together with them to produce better quality learning for the humanitarian sector again, but th for, through our academy centers and partners for what I call non-traditional actors, so people who are not recognized by the humanitarian system. So that's generally a partnership approach. I've got a couple of examples, and then I'll hand over to Marcus, around how to partner with us around content. If you have some good ideas around how to make content accessible for humanitarians, and keep in mind that uh, when I said that humanitarians need don't only need humanitarian content, they also need professional skills content, IT content, uh, leadership content. So if you have ideas, examples, uh, you, want to, you want to volunteer time or connect us with interesting individuals who are working on, on these types of projects, please do to reach out to me. Uh, then how do you take that content and make more interesting MOOCs or Spocs or uh, blended learning programs around that content? which is very localized, uh, which is very engaged, and again, bringing together various actors to do that. Again, a very interesting partnership we're looking at, at with the Open University uh, is how to use uh, MOOCs as a way to, to, to democratize access to, to some of the humanitarian learning. On the recognition piece, it's, it's looking at promoting existing badges or, or certification opportunities, which are there like the PMD Pro I'd mentioned, but also working together with us, giving your, lending your expertise around the, the, some of the learning pieces, around how to build out the body of knowledge, around how to self-assess, how to certify more effectively, more scalably. Um, and, and then on the, on the digital side, uh, again, you know, if you are looking at sort of, if you have ideas, I think a lot of you are working on open source platforms here. If you have some interesting innovations that you are, that you are building out, how can we share that, especially when it comes to Moodle and Totara. Uh, and we are, for example, with UNICEF has been using the same platform. They, we've been co-investing in an offline player to make learning more accessible for people in, in places with no, no bandwidth. So that's, that's a good example of that. But with the language skill sets as well, if you know people you know, speaking Spanish or French, though if, uh, that's, that's also uh, very helpful. And finally, on the knowledge and innovation side, it's, it's looking at um, uh, how do we, we co-develop some case studies. So this group here is, again, very interested in, in badges. So we could look at some, some case studies and research on the effectiveness of, of the recognition of uh, of uh, learning, uh, innovative learning solutions, but we're also convening very interesting user-centered design workshops where we bring together huma local humanitarians, we bring together academia, tech experts, and so if you want to be involved in those types of UCD processes where we're trying to bring not just humanitarians but people from outside to bring fresh ideas and perspectives, then do let me know and we can, uh, we can work together as well. So. I think, sorry, I, I, I spoke a lot and I spoke very fast, I'm quite aware, uh, but I'll, I'll make all the slides available and, and I'm happy to take questions. But I think it'd be good maybe I, I hand over to Marcus and then we collectively maybe take questions. Does, it, does that work? Yep. Thank you. So, am I audible here? Great, I see a thumbs up. Um, just so I know who we're talking to here. Uh, I understand there are a few people from humanitarian organizations in the room. Uh, if you raise your hands for some hand exercise, I see two, three, four, great. How many are working for professional associations in the room? No one, interesting. Um, and spoiler alert, I'll be mentioning the very exciting standard ISO IEC 17024. How many have heard of that before? One, good, <laughs> then, then the rest of you will not be bored. Um, so, um, I am working for an exciting professional association of humanitarian workers, uh, the one and only cross-sector one in the sector, fairly young one, six years old, um, and we have been working with the academy now over the past year or so, or very concretely for the last year or so, and then uh, part of a process that has been going on basically since the day 
the association started, um, which is finally coming to fruition now. Um, and just to, yeah, to mention a little bit about what I'll be talking about, the perspective I'm having here. So, particularly on the badging front, which is, which is uh, how we're working together now with, with uh, Atish. Um, great as a technical solution, um, but in the end it all comes down to what do these badges actually mean, uh, what is behind them, um, and, and then of course how can you present uh, what's behind them. And uh, I've already heard it from several people this morning, um, in terms of what the importance of the organization behind the badges, uh, the importance of, of network uh, of, of that can, can develop the value of a badge, uh, basically how, how is a badge credible and how can that credibility be displayed. So, that is, yeah, so I hope you excuse my, my PowerPoints are full of text and not any pretty images, but I'll try and go through them quickly, and if you want them, uh, I'll make them available together with Atisha's as well. So, just where we started here, um, I said the only cross-sector professional association in the sector, and, and a professional association of individuals, importantly, a fairly novel concept in the humanitarian sector, not in the rest of the world. Um, and in parallel, we were having this long, long and winding discussion about how to bring together a transformative system that can, can actually help with, with the recognition and learning and development in the sector. So fast forward to, yeah, so sorry, on and being the only professional association. If there are not that many professional association people in the, in the room, um, this is of course a very natural area for any professional association to move into uh, providing recognition solutions for their members and beyond. Um, so we started, of course, with identifying needs, ran a couple of really big surveys, um, cross-sector participation uh, across the sector. It's a, it's a very complex sector in that we're talking about um, people who are, as Atish mentioned, from um, people working at high level in the UN with very high salaries, very high L&D budgets, uh, down to, to local volunteers all working towards the same shared goals, but with very different um, um, possibilities for, for, for pursuing different, different solutions for recognition and for learning. Um, so we asked them both, um, both as individuals, uh, but, all, but in, in their capacity as employers and as uh, employees. So, in the sector, we found very strong support for, so to speak, proper certification. Um, and maybe I should explain quickly then with, on the terminology side, three, three kinds of um, related terms. We have certification, we have certificate programs, and we have accreditation that, that people tend to mix up quite a lot. Here, I'll be talking about certification as independent assessments of, of individuals that are time-bound, so for example, what a, what a doctor would have, uh, and so on. A certificate program would be instead be linked to a specific training course. Accreditation is basically what you do with organizations. Uh, an organization would be accredited to a standard, an individual would be certified. Um, so we found very strong support for these three, three components, that we need really robust and verifiable assessments. Uh, this was primarily a request, of course, from the employer side. Um, the independence from specific training courses for, for recognition solutions, um, we found very strongly both on the employee and the employer side. Employees not wanting to have to take the same course over and over again just to get recognized. They want to be able to choose how they get their, their, their recognition uh, and how to get their learning. And employers, they don't want to waste money on, on redoing things, of course. Then finally, also strong support for, for a maintenance and recertification criterion. Um, <coughs> anything that, that, that we, would, we would recognize in a sector that everything changes so rapidly, uh, it will get out of date very quickly and, and needs to be reassessed. Um, strong support all over it. So an important thing, and, and I think also interesting, 
given the title of this conference on the identity part. Um, in the humanitarian sector, the, the, um, there's a very strong organizational focus in, in almost all, all initiatives. A recent, uh, a recent study found, I think, about 120 standards for humanitarian work out there. Uh, and uh, basically all of them were all about organizational standards. What we're trying to do as a professional association is to, is to really bring out the, the role of the individual and the role of professional pride and professional identity that once again came through really strong here. People want to get recognized because, not because they want to get employed and, and they want to work for this or that organization. They want to show their skills. They want to build their professional identity, particularly important in an area like, un, like unitarian work where it's from the outside it's not really seen as a real job. Um, people need that people need to build their professional identity through, through, through various solutions. Um, and they also want to, to actually contribute in their individual capacity, also um, somewhat complicated in this sector. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, this is, this is an old process that has been going on, uh, discussing about these kinds of certification uh, processes and, and, and solutions. But there has been very, very strong uh, pushback over the years. Um, on the one hand, as I mentioned, the diversity of the sector. Um, it's too difficult to find something that applies to everyone. It's very difficult to draw a line around a sector like this. What is humanitarian work? There hasn't been a professional body to define that before. Uh, we also have the, the principle of volunteerism underlying a lot of the, the work in the sector. Um, and because of that and, and also different local acts, we don't want to be creating barriers to entry, rather raise the professional standard. People see certification as, as, a, as a way that could potentially create barriers instead. And then finally, there is, there is no central body that has the authority to, to uh, sort of regulate the entire sector. Um, so basically we needed a solution that's, that was robust, verifiable and legitimate to meet particularly the, the needs of the employers, um, but also that is but then flexible, scalable, and accessible to meet the needs of uh, individuals and smaller organizations. And more important in the sector, when, in a sector where most things are funded by donors and have a one to, to three year lifespan, it needs to be a long-term solution, um, so need a sustainable business model. So, there is a standard for that. Um, the very excitingly named ISO IAC 17024, uh, revised in 2012. Um, so, so our basic, basic approach is that we, we did not want to reinvent the wheel. Humanitarians are, are notorious for really loving to reinvent wheels. They're getting better at, at not doing so. Um, but there, there is a really solid solution out there that we, that we found. Uh, so we were more interested in, in finding the wheel and tweaking the wheel. Um, with that, so, so this ISO standard just shortly lays out the entire process for how to define and how to develop and maintain a, a certification program of individuals um, from conception, development, um, all the processes around it and, and the standards needed to, to be able to deliver this credibly. Um, there is also a quality assurance system globally. Um, it is often done by, by nat the national standards bodies in various countries. Uh, as we have a bit of a different approach, with, with, we're going global immediately, that is quite unusual. Um, we are turning to, to uh, ANSI, the American National Standards Institute. Uh, as they, have a, they are actually allowed to, to accredit organizations to the standard globally. Um, but we're tweaking it for the needs of the sector. So we're developing an ISO standard compliant micro certifications. The, the normal certifications that you see in the world is for full job role certifications. Uh, you are a, a registered nurse, um, you're a teacher, um, and, and you're, a, you're a practitioner in a specific area, it covers everything. Um, 
this is basically impossible in the, in the humanitarian sector at a basic level to define what is a humanitarian worker and not something that we wanted to do. Um, so we, we've taken it down a level. Uh, we're, looking, we're combining them with flexible and free self-assessments um, to, to be able to reach the scale that the academy is trying to reach. Um, we can't reach 200,000 people uh, if we charge for each of the assessments. Uh, so, so we're combining the two levels to make sure we, we can get the best of two worlds. Um, very quickly on the, on the key features here. I'll go through this just in, in, in uh, order. So it's demand driven as I mentioned. Um, people are actually asking for this, a very important part. Um, important for the humanitarian sector, we're not developing a license to practice. We're not saying this is something you need to have in order to practice. This is a, in all of our communication, we, we are really highlighting that this is one way that you can show that you're competent in these areas. Um, we're developing them for sector-wide applicability, um, looking at managing to define the areas that, that are actually shared by everyone. So we're looking at, at some of them in the first, first round, looking at, at just understanding the overall system, we're looking at understanding the humanitarian principles and how to apply them. Uh, there are four, four of those core principles that are normally used, and we're looking at legal frameworks. And we're looking at a foundational level for everyone. Um, so a very important part then is the independent assessment. Um, that it's flexible, uh, that, it's an, that it's an assessment that is not bound to any specific training. And I think that that's what a lot of people in, in the room are looking at for, for other things as well. Not necessarily recognizing um, whether people have taken a course in, in this or that, but whether have they actually achieved some, something substantial, have, have they actually learned something. So it has to follow very specific models for, for, for ISO compliance, um, but we're, we're trying to make sure we're following the ways that are actually more cost effective so we can get the cost down. But linking that up then with, with a learner guidance framework where we can point to all the different ways that people can learn this. Um, based in practice, um, an important part is also important for the humanitarian sector. Um, it's, it's based in actual practice and it's not based on an, on an interagency uh, process for, for coming to an agreement about, about everything. Instead, um, actually asking people through a specific process um, what do they need to do their work, how do they do it. Um, and the, 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 for the actual assessment we're, we're looking at, it, it needs to be in-person invigilated or online invigilated with an actual person on the other side. Um, and this whole thing then results in a verifiable digital certificate, a, a, a digital badge, uh, which we'll be working with, uh, with the Humanitarian Leadership Academy on. And also important, making sure that we get continued relevance for, these, um, um, for this recognition. So as with any ISO compliant certification, there are um, maintenance and renewal requirements. You have to set when will it expire, how can you get it again after that time? And also then very importantly here for the, on the badging side, um, combining it then with a free self-assessment option, which is developed in the same rigorous manner, but would not require the invigilated, um, the, the, the invigilated assessments, so we could actually deliver it for free instead. Um, this can both serve as a diagnostic tool, pointing people where the weak points are so they can prepare them for, for an actual paid invigilated assessment, or it can stand on its own, can get a badge for having taken a self-assessment. Um, it can also be broken down into its components, into mini-assessments, but to have really solid, solid mini-assessments developed. I don't think I'll talk much about this. Uh, it's just an, an outline about how we're actually working on this. We're in the middle of developing them to get them launched in, in early 2017. Uh, normally, for anyone interested, 
developing a, a, a full job role uh, certification normally will take you between 9 to 18 months. Um, we've cut that down both because of general time constraints but also because we're looking at the micro level. So we're developing them now at, during six months. I would not recommend this. Uh, budget enough time for it if you're doing something like this. Um, standard costs for a full job role analysis is in the range of $100,000, euros, plus minus depending on, on how you actually lay out the process. Um, like I said, skipping all of this. Looking just quickly at the larger ecosystem. So this is part of the Collaboration Center on Recognition of Skills, Learning and Experience. Um, and the whole idea is that we're, we're building an, an ecosystem for both formal and informal recognition solutions, um, both along the lines, both, both with ISO compliant certifications, but also pointing to other, other ways of getting recognized. Um, there is, this is just a, a chart to, to illustrate a little bit how the different components work together. So on the one hand, if you look on the, on the right, you would have the standard certification track. You have your standard, you do your eligibility check, you take your, your invigilated assessment, you get certified, then you get recertified and you're hopefully continuing on that track and have your, your digital badge for that. Um, middle part would be the self-assessment part, so non-invigilated, and it can be used either for getting your diagnostic tools, saying you need to, you're, you're, you're uh, good to go now for the assessment, or you have these weak points, um, but you could also pass it uh, and get a, a non-verified badge, which uh, would of course need to be, they, they get the visual challenge on the badging side, to how to discern between these two badges while not, while not being too demeaning towards, towards the, that non-verified one. And then on the left side, we have more what the academy um, will be working on, on more directly with, with the Kaya platform. So dividing up the standard into its different components, providing those as, to the extent possible as separate modules, possibly providing badges on the, when we were talking micro certification, so I guess nano uh, badges, um, leading them, them through, the, either leading them through an entire process or specific ones based on a self-assessment. Um, and yeah, and that, on, on the big challenge on the, on the badging side, which we have in front of us now in the coming two, three months, uh, will be how to actually discern between all of these different tracks and then combining this with the larger ecosystem that, that um, the Academy is, is planning for. It, I think it's gonna be a huge challenge, but uh, it would be interesting to hear any input from, from others in the room as well on, on if people have managed that in a, in a good way. Uh, another chart just on, on the overall approach. So we're dealing everything this, so interestingly enough, parts of this disappeared now. Uh, but there's, yeah, there's a competencies framework on the side. Mm -hmm. We're pulling out very specific parts of it, creating certifications, and then further dividing it up. Um, last mention, there is also this then humanitarian passport initiative as the even larger framework which apart from this collaboration center that I just mentioned also contains another collaboration center uh, for quality humanitarian learning, which is right now getting started up, but will then be focusing more on developing standards and accreditation uh, for organizations providing learning. So on the badging side, um, we would be looking also at solutions at, at how to discern badges provided by a quality uh, uh, an accredited quality learning provider versus a non-accredited one. Um, so there's some, some interesting graphical challenges coming up there. Sorry for, for a lot of text um, and, and a fairly, fairly technical presentation, but happy to, to, uh, to talk more about this if anyone is interested. You have my email there, and, and uh, like I said, Atish, I think you can make the slides available if anyone is interested. Thank you. So, so ha happy to t take questions very quickly. I think Serge is looking at me with a frown on his face. Uh, maybe just, maybe a couple. Yes. Just.
right at the back. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, this may be a question for you both. I'm, I'm uh, quite taken aback. That's a, a very comprehensive uh, approach um, and very rigorous one. And that leads to my question, which is, um, you have uh, sort of a rigorous definition of uh, what the competencies are for um, skills or roles, and you have um, an invigilated approach and a self-assessed approach. That's my question is, in terms of recognition of badges that could originate from elsewhere, from outside the system, are you developing policies for recognizing those that may or may not match uh, your, your frameworks and included in that informal recognition of informal learning, not necessarily the formal. So in other words, good enough for particular situations. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start and then Marcus can, can, can fill in. So I, I think the, the mechanism what we're looking at, at now was, I think that this project came about from the humanitarian passport, which was looking at sort of a more let's say, structured approach at this. Um, but I think that piece which Marcus was referring to at the end, the quality framework for other providers to, to also issue badges against this, uh, against this framework is looking at precisely that, is looking at how do other providers uh, also issue badges, whether they're more light touch badges, uh, which are self-assessed based or based on informal learning, uh, or the more rigorous ones as well. So, uh, yes, the idea is very much, we're, we're going through a piloting phase first, just to see how, how it goes. And I think the idea is very much, if, if this has to scale up, to, to create those, those mechanisms for other organizations. And if you remember the chart I showed where other organizations are also issuing badges into this ecosystem, uh, it definitely relies on other, other organi humanitarian organizations buying into this as well. But I'll, I'll defer to Marcus as well on the more formal side. Yeah, so the... I think it, um, in the humanitarian sector, it comes down a lot to, to professional accountability and the, and the lack of systems for it. Um, in, a, in a sector that deals directly with people's lives, um, it, th there is need in the first phase now to introduce the rigorous standards that have not really existed for, for individuals. Uh, I mean, no one would, would question it for, for doctors and the like. Um, but, but people in general are, are dealing so directly with people's lives. So that, that rigor is, is definitely needed. Um, and, and as a professional association, as PIAP, I mean, that, that will be our focus in the first, that, that's our core audience, the people really working at a, at a professional level in the sector. Um, I think the other area is, is really interesting and it will be interesting to, to move more and more into that area. Um, but, but yeah, the, on, as a professional association, I think our, our, our our perspective is that the rigor, um, if, if someone, basically if someone says they know something, they, they better darn know, know it. Uh, so so the, the focus is, is on, on us being able to credibly say that, uh, that, that this person knows it. So, so the, the, uh, the rigor and verifiability of it is the, is the focus in the first one, then to be complemented with, with other solutions around it. But, but still pointed to this being the, the cornerstone of it. Okay. It's uh, with a, a subscriber to Bernard's uh, blog. Yeah? Only you? Okay, that's not... Okay, so I hope that after that you will... Uh, subscribe more to uh, his blog.